Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by the Francis Family Foundation, the Hall Family Foundation, the H&R Block Foundation, the Courtney S. Turner Foundation, the Spies Memorial Trust, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Maris Aylward. This week we've got more for you on Arts Upload. From a place that's pretty much heaven on earth yes. for me, that would be the roastery where great coffee is always flowing. Stories about metal magicians and musical legends. Poets and masters of chalk in action. It's all ahead on the Upload. Call the role of Kansas City's musical heroes. A lot of jazz comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Benny Moat, Mary Lou Williams, and of course Charlie Parker. Pat Metheny and Bert Bacharach are also from here. And of course Gene Clark. Well, he was <laughs> a co-founding member of the Birds and wrote a lot of songs that rock and roll bands still play today. November 17th, which would have been his 70th birthday, was proclaimed Gene Clark Day by Missouri Governor Jay Nixon. That night, musicians paid tribute to him in a concert at Knuckleheads, and later in the week, the Gene Clark Symposium drew even more of the true believers to town. He was born in Tipton, Missouri. His family moved to Kansas City. He was a baby and grew up here, he went to Raytown High, and then graduated from Bonner Springs High. So he was an important part of Kansas City's music history. You know, Gene, he heard the Beatles, and uh, that kind of changed his mind about wanting to stay just in the folk vein. It was folk music back in 1963, which first whisked Gene away from Kansas City. Seems several members of the new Christie Minstrels, remember them? Were in town performing at Starlight Theater. Saw Gene's group, the Surfriders, playing at a club on the landing, and pretty much offered him a job on the spot. Just a year later, Gene Clark's storybook tale took another amazing turn. He met Roger McGuinn at Troubadour in Hollywood after he left Christie Minstrel. And David Crosby ambled over and started singing some third part harmonies. And before he knew it, the birds were born. By the time Gene was 21 years old, he had a number one hit. Only uh, about a year before that, he was out driving a tractor in a field. So it was kind of, you know, phew, you know, skyrocket to the moon kind of thing. Well, I've been running around, trying to prove I was in love. But the man who took us eight miles high couldn't maintain the orbit for long. Just two years later, ironically in part due to a fear of flying, Gene left the group to embark on a series of solo projects and musical partnerships with some of the best folk, rock, and country players around. A 25-year musical odyssey detailed in a documentary called The Bird Who Flew Alone. And I laughed as the Joker said, lead on. And all along, he continued to make music admired by his peers but largely ignored by the record buying public. There's a train leaves here this morning, I don't know what I might be on. In 1991, burdened by problems with drugs and alcohol, Gene Clark died at the age of only 46. Have you seen the change in rivers? Now they wait their turn to die. There's a handful of his songs that people just go crazy over. And once they hear those, they want to go a little bit deeper. And they get a little bit deeper into the catalog, and they find another handful that they like just as well. And then they'll go a little bit deeper. And at that point, you're stuck. You know, it's like the La Brea Tar Pits. Have you seen, have you seen the silver raven? She has wings and she can fly. Cell phone. Thank you. Though it's mostly symbolic, 
The no cell phone rule to prohibit bootlegging is in effect here at the Phillips Hotel, just three days after what would have been Gene Clark's 70th birthday. Like the first one three years earlier, this symposium has drawn participants from near and far. The kind of writers, fans, and collectors who just can't get enough of the music Gene Clark made. Some of them come from original tape reels from 1966 that Gene actually made as five demo songs. You said I love you, wish you were here. Gene Clark, in my opinion, will be seen in history as the greatest combination singer-songwriter who's ever lived. To me, he's up there with Neil Young and Bob Dylan and at, at that level. But people, you know, Gene who? He had a great voice. He had great lyrics, incredible music, just ethereal music, almost like, like a Mozart or Puccini. I'm a musician myself, so I tend to hear the chord changes. And I'm, one of the songs they just played, I'm, I'm sitting there going, OK, that's C, E minor, la, la, la. and then all of a sudden it's like, what the heck was that? David Crosby said, Gene Clark didn't know the rules for writing music. So he just wrote it however he wanted it to sound. What a prolific songwriter he was. It never stopped. To the day he died, he was still producing music. I'm fascinated by his creativity. There's only a certain percentage of all that stuff that he wrote that ever made it to being released records. And I want to hear it all. Deep discussions about deep cuts dominate the proceedings. But there's also time for symposium goers to get out and see some of the places that helped shape Gene Clark's art. Like this railroad trestle near the family's home at the edge of Swope Park. He later wrote a song called Kansas City Southern. Or the venerable old Dairy Dine, where Bonner Springs teens like Gene spent lots of their leisure time. And of course, 100 miles to the east, his first home and final resting place. This year, Tipton, Missouri and Los Angeles also held Gene Clark tribute concerts. There was just something about Gene that you know, people were drawn to, not only in terms of his musical talent and his songwriting ability, but just you know, him as a person, you know, despite you know, whatever demons he might have had and uh, things he struggled with. He was still, people still loved Gene a, a lot. I here set my hand to be caused to be affixed this great seal that proclaims November 17th to be Gene Clark Day in Missouri. Oh. Here, R.E.M. and what they did in Athens, Georgia, you know, or in the early 90s country sound in Nashville. You know, there, it's a big Birds influence. So, you know, a big Gene Clark influence, you know, all over. The songs in, have endured, you know, some of them for, for 50 years, and I think they'll continue to endure. And I'll probably feel a whole lot better when you're gone. Now when you're gone. In case you're wondering, we are here in what they call the cupping room mm -hmm. at the Roasteries Bean Hangar. It's actually in here that they've come up with so many of those great blends that they're so well known for. Yes. Great songwriting is one way artists can express themselves. Poetry is another. In fact, here on the Upload, we really like to showcase some of the area's premier poets performing their work. Here's Alyssa Bennett-Smith, co-slam master of the Poetic Underground's Pound Slam at the Uptown Arts Bar. The poem's called Manifest Destiny. Bile me under acquired taste. Too thin for some and too thick for most. I am Rubenesque, salt of the earth with extra curves in too many places, child-bearing hips that will never bear fruit and skin so porcelain it could be canvas. So paint a picture in your mind of what you would change, the edges you would shave, the voice you would silence, because I come from broad waters brisk winds and history to a city of quick rivers and breezes bearing the stench of humidity and forgetfulness. 
Your waters are shallow, your current weak, and I have not the patience to wade when I am accustomed to diving into the depths, feeling the sun on my canvas flesh and having plenty of space to grow. Outside your dotted lines that help you understand that which is beyond your reach. By enforcing parameters, restrictions, toned definitions of what you will accept as yours. So go ahead, file me under acquired taste. It may help you realize that some things are not yours to acquire. When you're driving down 18th Street across from the Lyric Opera's complex and see a sign that says Machine Head, you may have wondered what exactly the building behind it might contain. Is it a factory, an art space, a musical illusion? Maybe it's all of them, as producer Ashley Holcroft will now explain. My name's Dick Job. I'm the owner of Machine Head. I started out my career as Dr. Volvo, and in 1982, I bought this building right here, but always felt like I wanted to do a little something more creative than just fixing cars. And so I went back to school and got my machine tool technology degree and also advanced welding. The Crossroads District was just starting up right then, and so all my friends worked in the art galleries, and so they would give me different projects to do, and it's just kind of grown from there. Here at Machine Head, the motto is, if it's too hard for everyone else, they bring it to us. But what exactly does that mean? Well, let's say you've got a World War I tank, and say that century-old butte needs a new muffler. Well, then you'd call Machine Head. Or let's just say you've got yourself a Duesenberg, like the one seen here with Spain's King Alfonso VIII. And after 80, molly coddled, years, the hinges give out. The original part had a casting flaw in it, which is just like a little inclusion in the casting so it wasn't perfectly smooth. And I thought, oh gosh, he's not gonna like this. And he was thrilled that it was still there because it was made that part more original. Or say you need a stand for a giant Camarasaurus leg. They've got you covered. Creative problem solving is a huge, huge, huge part of what we do here. We take a lot of pride in, in our work and we build interesting projects that they're, they're all pretty much one-off and I really like that aspect of it. Or say you're quixotic and you need one of these made. So you can do this and it needs to break down into segments so it can commute from venue to venue which is actually what brought Matt Bennett, Job's right-hand man, to Machine Head in the first place. One of the aerialists and I used some wire and hot glue to kind of make a rough idea of what we were talking about. And I came down here, showed him that. He loved the design of it. He asked me if I wanted to help out. Yeah, that sounds great, I'd love to. And we went through that project, it, it went off really well, and he asked me to come back, and so I just, kept coming back. And it's a smaller crew here, which I think is better because it's a little more intimate. We know each other really well. And an important part of that small crew is resident artist Beth Nybeck. It's a partnership that has included dozens of projects. Everything from building a 100-foot truss to suspend 21 aluminum birds aloft at a Los Angeles airport, to their latest collaboration, this piece that will be bound for Gladstone, Missouri in just one short week. She comes up with the idea, and then between the two of us, we figure out how to build it. And we haven't found anything yet that we haven't been able to do. Well, we need length, so you said 93.71. When I first moved to Kansas City almost five years ago, I met him shortly afterwards, six or seven months, and um, toured the shop, and I really got to know him. And he really took me under his wing and uh, really adopted me into his family. And so um, he and, and his wife and, and their dog, I know them all very well. So every once in a while on a project, there'll be something that I design in that I don't have the equipment for. and so. I'll come on over to Machine Head and Dick has all the equipment here to help uh, really execute a lot of complicated builds. Whoa, Beth. 
looks great. Thanks. Whoa. All done. We're ready to roll. Is it is that 120 grit? 60 grit, actually. Grr. Rawr. Whoa. <laughs> Looks great. If I don't have the tools to do it, I know who does. We call it the good old boy network, and I've been doing this for a long time and, and have established a network of friends. But usually, on it's, it's pretty rare that we need anybody else. It's ready, and so am I. People, when they just drive by, they have no idea what goes on back here. Sometimes they'll be just driving down 18th Street and see our sign and just stop in and go, what are you guys doing here anyway? And uh, if I have time, I'll bring them back here and give them a little tour and then they, they go, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. You do all this back here? We had no idea. They don't know that we build art or work for Children's Mercy Hospital or all the different things that we do. They have no idea that it happens in here. We're all artists in our own way, shape, and form here. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of head scratching. But at the end of the day, when we finish a project and it comes out exactly the way we want it to, that's the most satisfying thing for me. A lot of people don't want to take the time to sit down with someone and talk through a lot of the options and we're willing to take that time. And I think that's really what sets us apart from most other fabrication shops around town. And it's that paradigm that is the hallmark of every machine head project. From custom cogs to elaborate signage. MK12, when they came to me with that project, I looked at it and I said, ooh, pretty complicated. And then I started counting all of the text and there were 98 letters. And I looked at the guys and I said, are you kidding me? Whoa! And they said, no, that's really what we want. That's what we want. I can't imagine a better town to, to do what we do in. We help other people and they help us. And it's kind of a community effort a lot of times. And I don't think you get that in a lot of other cities. I think in a lot of other cities, you're kind of on your own and everybody is kind of withdrawn because they're afraid you might learn a secret from them. And in this environment in Kansas City, everybody seems like they want to help each other. Hopefully we'll be able to continue this for years to come. You know, I've got to think that without coffee, a whole lot less art might get made. In fact, here at the Roastery, they've got a gallery that's been a part of First Fridays from time to time over the years. Right now, they're air roasting a new batch of coffee, so it smells amazing in here. And they're doing it right underneath a sculpture created by the artist Stretch. It's inspired by the DT3 sitting on top of the roof here at 27th and Holly. I guess we've got to get past the aromas. Focus. And on to the last story here on Art's Upload, which takes us back to a time when computer screens were a lot less prevalent in the classroom than they are today. We're talking about chalkboards <laughs> here and a mysterious duo called Danger Dust at the Columbus School of Art and Design in Ohio. Seems that each and every week they make their mark in a way that you'd have to call old school. love the idea of taking something that's like ordinary and then turning it into something that's like special. Yeah. Chalk is just so, it's in every classroom. You've been exposed to it since you were a little kid and asking something to do something that it's not intended to do. When we first started it, just no one knew who was doing it just because like it was so new and um, it was kind of like we were graffiti artists in some way, like, oh, who did that chalkboard? And it, it felt very like mischievous. And so yeah. we wanted to come up with a name that was like sort of played on that. Like, yeah, it's, it's graffiti, I guess, but it's like <laughs> not at all at the same time. Yeah. We are both advertising graphic design. We have minors in copywriting. 
I mean, neither of us had ever done chalk before, and it just seemed like a fun, easy thing to do. And when we first started, we didn't think it was going to be this big. Yeah, we'll come in, like, we'll, we'll do the planning beforehand. It takes, it takes at least a day to plan, just yeah. to, like, figure out, like, what quote you're searching for. We have a catalog of quotes, and this one's been one that we've been wanting to do for a while. I don't know, we just thought of, like, we brainstormed, like, kitchen utensils that would be fun to draw, and yeah. obviously, gotta have some butter in there. We added the book and the cloth, like the towel in the bottom and the top at the last minute. Because we wanted to fill those spaces just because they felt mm -hmm. a little empty. I didn't want to put eggs on there just because I thought they'd be a boring shape. We both love to draw, but neither one of us are really great at drawing like... Without a reference. <laughs> yeah, if, if someone asked us to draw like a person or a dog mm -hmm. or something, we would both need to look at a reference. But with letters, you can just you can just draw them and they can be as abstract or as not as you want. And that's fun. That's, that's what I love about it. Just pure chalking time is usually five or six hours. One of the boards took like nine hours and then we're coughing up chalk dust. We close the doors so that while we're working, no one can like come in and see. Um, this is the only classroom that has locks on both of the doors. <laughs> so that's why we've staked this one out. This week was the first time that we tried sharpening the chalk. Yeah, sharpening the chalk and then paint brushes. That was yeah. fun. Well, flour just felt like a very like light, airy, kind of fluffy thing and blending it felt more natural with the brushes. You know, you get a different um, effect from it, like when you're using your hands to blend it, when you're using a cloth to blend it, when you're using a Q-tip, and we realize now with the brush. We use Q-tips, we've used a lot of Q-tips, um, but they're nice for, uh, for like, especially like if you get them white, you can like clean a sharp edge with them. The fact that it's only a week helps you just like let it go. Really, that's my favorite part of it, the fact that it's like gone. Yeah. It's kind of liberating because like the, the work you do like for your school projects, it's, it's so long and drawn out and extended, but with this it's like something new every week. It's chalk. Yeah, it's never, it's never going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Breaking away from a comfort zone is a good thing. Some of the first quotes we did um, were quotes that like one of our teachers told us in class that they really influenced me and I, I, I guess part of it was just wanting to share that. It's fun working with your hands and getting your hands dirty and like feeling exhausted at the, like when you're done with it, putting your whole body into something. I can, I can be doing four things at once while I'm working on the computer, but with chalk, you have to just be doing like chalk. Because you have Q-tips and brushes and chalk and be, rags in your and hands. And you have to like go up in the corner and stand on the chair yeah. and go down to the other corner to fix that smudge, you know. We're um, an anonymous duo of chalk artists, and every week we create a new chalkboard, and after that week is over, we come back and erase it and do another one. for joining us on another edition of Arts Upload. We hope you've enjoyed it. We're out to prove that Kansas City is America's creative crossroads and drink a little good coffee in the yeah. process. From the Roastery, I'm Mary Saylor. And I'm Randy Mason, and what better way to close it out than with our old coffee house pals Brewer and Shipley at Knuckleheads. See you next week.
Pull out the powder, shoot with the empty gun, and shoot with the empty gun. Pull out the highway, and leave me no place to run. Oh, ho, ho, babe, open your window and let that fresh air blow. They shake, babe, shake off your demon and watch. Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by the Francis Family Foundation, the Hall Family Foundation, the H&R Block Foundation, the Courtney S. Turner Foundation, the Spies Memorial Trust, and viewers like you. Thank you.